Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Robert Stark. My uh, guest for today is uh, Paul Bingham. Hey, Paul, uh, nice having you on. Uh, thank you for having me, Robert. So uh, you have a new book out. It's called Down uh, Where the Devil Don't Go, and it's published by uh, Nine Banded Books. Yeah, it's just come out uh, this month, I believe. Uh, it's uh, my first book. And uh, I, I guess you, you can talk about the overall uh, theme of the book, but the theme of the book is uh, it's about uh, men uh, at war. Well, uh, we put the uh, kind of the description of it is called uh, sardonic tales of men at war with various aspects of uh, themselves or the world around them. I was kind of telling uh, Chip uh, Smith, the publisher, my publisher and uh, editor of these stories, that uh, I felt that the four stories kind of worked together, and Chip was probably the first editor I came across who recognized that um, I had written, written these stories and kind of tied them in to get uh, each story is kind of tied to each uh, to the next one in some fashion. There's certain connections that the reader can find that each story has, but moreover, uh, one of the points of the stories is that uh, each one demonstrates a different kind of men. Uh, there are two men of action in these stor stories, and there are two men who are naturally not active types and who are more inclined to act in a less masculine fashion to... Uh, get their point across or to accomplish their aims. And uh, so basically I compare it to uh, a work by Mishima. It's unintentional, but uh, Mishima uh, demonstrates various types of men, of men in one of, one of his collections of short stories. I just remember which one it was. But uh, different types of men in conflict with one another and or with not in with one another but uh with different again aspects or uh or uh parts of themselves or with other individuals for example uh in one of his stories it's about an actor who is a bodybuilder and uh basic and also a kept man a gigolo for a uh, wealthy uh mafia type woman and in that, uh, Mishima explores the actor's uh, interest in uh, narcissism and sadomasochism. And uh, in the case of uh, my stories, um, we have a similar thing going on where y you, he has an actor who is a bodybuilder and he has a boxer. And he has a businessman and he has uh, <clears throat> one other figure, I just remember, but uh, essentially two men of action and two men of uh, commerce or letters or what have you. In mine, I have a writer, I have a Hollywood producer, and I have a, a ex-bodyguard, what have you, in my detective story, uh, uh, What the Dead Men Fear, and I also have a uh, ex-soldier uh, who has returned from Iraq with uh, post-traumatic uh, syndrome and uh, he's uh, he's remembering all uh, all those things that have gone on in Iraq and uh, essentially things end well for the two desk men comparatively well and particularly poorly for the two men of action and that's often the case uh, because a man finds in, in this world today you'll see those signs quite often death rather than dishonor and uh, very few people intend to act on those signs in any way, shape, or form. But uh, the protagonists, uh, the men of action in those two stories, uh, I feel all right. And uh, what the dead men fear, feel that death is, in fact, preferable to dishonor. Uh, before, I'd like to get into some of the stories in a little more detail, if that's okay. But before I get to that, I'd like to ask you, so what originally attracted you to uh, uh, Chip Smith's uh, Nine Banded Books? Uh, I wrote these um, stories I call Americana stories because uh, 
I was very unhappy with the state of short stories in uh, 2005, 2006. And so I wrote Americana stories, which I wanted to create figures that seemed more like the type of individual that actually existed in the world today and not and not a uh, character that was created by a college professor who may seem to be the only kind of people writing short stories these days if you ever if you ever catch up with the <clears throat> best american short story uh, anthologies uh, which are often edited by academics you'll find that they're very dreary reading very liberal very left wing um, and mainly boring that's the their capital sin in my book and completely out of touch so i wanted to write these stories and i did write them <clears throat> and four of these are in this collection i wrote more than that but uh once i uh, had written them i uh, looked around and i was at a loss for a publisher and at the time i had been uh, reading i was in libertarian circles quite a bit and i was reading uh uh, a blog by a guy who goes by the name T G G P, and I cannot for the life of me remember what remember what that stands for. But he has a he had a blog called Entitled to a, an Opinion, and uh, he uh, first of all uh, run an interview with Chip, and I kind of read uh, Nine Banded Books, and I read. Uh, the first book uh, Chip put out, or one of the first, um, which is by L.A. Rollins, and it's called The Myth of Natural Rights. But in itself, it was more of an uh, anthology of uh, L.A. LA Rollins' writings. Uh, he had uh, his version of the Devil's Dictionary, which is called Lucifer's Lexicon, and just a bunch of other writings about Holocaust denial and other matters. And I just thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen, so... Uh, Naturally, I was uh, I was interested to see if uh, I could get on because that seemed to be my best alternative at this point. Uh, because I could not find another publisher, you know, interested in tackling even the milder stories that I had written. And consequently, I uh, Chip's been a was been a wonderful editor and a really good publisher in my opinion. And uh, Andy Nowicki, who also writes uh, short stories, he wrote the introduction. Uh, he wrote the introduction to it. What is what? What can you say about the introduction that uh, Andy wrote? Uh, I quite enjoy Andy's writing, and I'm really flattered by it. But uh, honestly, uh, uh, I think he. Uh, if anything, I'm I'm just uh, I'm just kind of overwhelmed by it. Uh, uh, he's. Uh, I I really have to give. Andy, a lot of credit as a writer, and I will say that I have not always felt that way about his writing. Um, from his, I didn't care for his first novel, and uh, are you talking about uh, Under the, the Nihil? Under the Nihil, and I, I've, I wasn't particularly impressed with that work, but uh, since then, um, it bears repeated reading, and uh, I think a lot of his books. Are going to have a lot of stamina, and they're going to be appreciated uh, long term. You know, uh, I don't know how much people are going to read in the future. I think illiteracy is uh, on the horizon, and the novel is, and the written word is largely going to disappear within the next 50 years. But I could be grossly off base this, uh, uh, there, but uh, I do believe Andy's works will last. Uh, He's a Catholic writer. I classify him as a Catholic writer. And uh, there are a lot of Catholic writers that are very influential to me. And I see him as kind of like uh, Evelyn Waugh and Alice Thomas Ellis. Uh, not many people have read her her works, but um, in this country at least. But um, she was a bestseller in, in uh, England for quite some time, and she's really superlative author and I kind of feel Andy just keeps plugging away he's put out more content certainly than I have in the, in the last few years and uh, I think he's going to become more than a cult author I think he's going to uh, have a massive impact long term on the literary um, the literary, literary scene and 
um, the whole cultural war as it is still being waged by uh, certain parts of the alternative right, as uh, they call themselves, and other yeah, most branches. Of his, so you're saying that uh, right now I'd say the majority of his following is within the alternative right, but uh, you see a I lot think of... It will expand. Yeah. I think you're right. I think I think he will have a significant impact on the younger generation, such as it is of those uh, young men that are uh, putting out their books, and uh, those young men who read will be more inclined to read Andy Nowicki. I'll put it that way. And uh, you're relatively uh, young. I mean, if, how old are you if you want to say your age? You don't have to. I'm under 30. Okay. So am I. And yeah. uh, what? so what is the significance of the title, uh, Down Where the Devil Don't Go? Uh, I wrote it in an underground warehouse, and it was unoccupied at the time and dark and all that, so it's kind of a joke, if anything. But it's more than a joke, actually. It's uh, one of those areas where the right has kind of gotten into a position where, uh, and I don't consider it myself necessarily a right winger but um certainly not a left winger not a liberal but the right has gotten into a position where it's uh people on the alternative right are willing to go into areas or aspects of human nature or humanity that no one else wants to touch that are untouchable unapproachable that are walled off cloistered allowed to uh remain in darkness and these areas that the right is willing to shine a light into, to explore, to try to understand areas of human nature, uh, human biodiversity, what have you, um, understanding, uh, being willing to consider bringing back the ideas, resurrecting the ideas of the past and instituting them in the future, this is all part of what I call, you know, look, going beyond where the devil wants to go, or wants us to go, certainly. So, yeah, that's the, that is that is the theme of the title. I get what you're saying. And I guess we can talk about some of the stories. Uh, I'll start off with, uh, so I read the, well, first of all, there's a review up uh, by James O'Mara up on a countercurrence, and I think that is the main, that is probably the main review of the book that's up so far. Yeah, I haven't, uh, I'm planning to ship a lot of copies off to uh, other uh, book reviewers in not too long, but uh, there hasn't been another one. I quite enjoyed James's reviews. I'm one of James's biggest fans, and I believe I have the, uh, the honor of being the first one to uh, uh, interview him on the air uh, back uh, about four or five years ago. Uh, but um, I think uh, in a couple of uh, I, I like James's review, but I think he misses the mark in a couple of areas. I take his criticism very much to heart. I think it's very constructive, but uh, partially dealing with the two stories, um, he uh, kind of misses the point. And I wrote these stories on several levels. Uh, Population eyes is was written on several levels, and it's not really about a writer writer who has writer's block because when you think about it writer's block is not if you're if you're in literary circles nobody will admit to having writer's block i mean even if i've never had writer's block and even if there is there are people out there who have writer's block they'd never admit it the story is about a writer and i wrote this specifically because uh, i used to listen to npr a lot in the past and uh those individuals who do those short pieces on M NPR. And uh, I got to thinking about the life of your typical uh, creative writing instructor, yeah, especially a creative writing instructor in the Midwest or South. And often they find themselves, they kind of think they're, they're surrounded by enemies on all sides. or And uh, they have a novel view of the world around them. And uh, so 
I'm not really dealing with the blocked writer. I'm dealing with the entire experience of the liberal writer. I'm kind of turning things around in some ways because uh, liberal writers writing about rightist uh, neuroses uh, is, a con- is a quite common theme. So I'm just, you know, I probably could be accused of just uh, reversing that and turning it around on uh, on the left, as it were. But I think it's more than that. That was not my ne- uh, necessarily my intention. It was also uh, something like uh, probably trying to uh, present a different view of individuals. Again, I'm talking about individuals that ordinarily uh, would not be written about. The only person who would write about a creative writer would be a creative, an academic who taught creative writing. Nobody else cares or is interested in a creative writing instructor in a small college. So, uh, and uh, you go on to uh, protocols to learn to elders of Hollywood. No one's really interested in a uh, in a studio exec, in the life of a studio exec, and, or what his machinations are, unless they have to do with sex, drugs, or something that uh, one could craft a novel around. So I'm taking these figures and taking them out of their uh, regular context, as we might say, and looking at them through the eyes of a different individual or a different writer. And at the time, I was uh, I had written a novel, uh, a full-length novel. It's quite a large novel, and uh, it's about the war on terrorism. And uh, I'd written this massive novel, and I realized there's no way in hell I can get this thing published. Uh, there's no publisher in the world that would take this book. It's not necessarily because it's bad. Um, it's written about this, you know, different style than these stories, but um, certainly not the worst writing in the world. I've studied creative writing. I've read many books on the subject. I've studied it in depth for over a decade, but the stories are just not in, in tune with the uh, the political uh, outlook of the right or left, so uh, good luck with finding a publisher. So uh, having written that book, I was kind of looking at creative writing and creative writing uh, professors and teachers and the whole publishing industry and uh, from a jaundiced outlook, and that's how Population I came to be. Is there a... And, uh, so I take James' uh, points to heart, but uh, there's a, there's more to the Population I and protocols of the learned elders of Hollywood than one might take. It, it, it might take repeat reading to kind of develop the to or understand the whole thesis of these stories. Is there anything uh, in reference to politics in the books, in the, in the series? There's nothing specifically in reference to parties or politics or anything like that. But um, I generally wrote the stories from the perspective of what we might call a Tory anarchist perspective. I don't consider myself a Tory anarchist. But it's written from a Tory anarchist perspective. It's sardonic. It's... Uh, it's uh, somewhat nation. It's certainly interested in the tragic. It's interested in uh, it's interested in people. It's not so respectful of uh, societal mores, uh, middle class societal mores. But it's not at the same time in any way uh, a liberal uh, outlook. Certainly, but as far as mainstream politics, it has you know no connection to. Such things. Is there something? There's a one of the characters. I'm char- not trying to put out a political. I'm, reading- I'm not trying to put out a political message, basically. So there is. Uh, I'm reading in the James O'Meara review, but uh, it says there's uh, one of the characters is a, is a sadistic a sadistic skinhead who writes for porn mags. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, I don't consider him sadistic, but um, he is he is what he is. Uh, it's kind of a pastiche of uh, Jim Goad back in the late 90s when I used to start reading, start reading James uh, Goad, and uh, that uh, character is loosely based on James Goad. I'm surprised n- nobody has uh, has really noticed um, that 
it's basically Jim Goat we're talking about. <laughs> and that is, uh, so is that one of the side characters? That's not a main character. No. It's he's he's just a uh, he makes a cameo appearance, as I would put it. And so uh, actually, uh, it's one of those. Uh, It's one of those, uh, I guess, uh, I, le- I read a lot of uh, Jim Goad back in the, back when he started publishing when he got out of prison, and uh, that's basically him, uh, his, in his own words, uh, directed toward the liberal establishment of writers because he faced the same problems that I think a lot of writers have interesting writers, entertaining writers ha- have that they just simply can't uh, they're not allowed to uh, break into the mainstream whatsoever find their audience yeah I think that is true because you have a lot of like you mentioned Andy Nowicki some of these writers because they're affiliated with uh, with certain uh, political political uh, philosophical stuff uh, that would be sort of a barrier for them to get it get uh, and take to get uh, to get their work published by a mainstream publisher. Yeah, and it's it's quite pro- it's a quite prolific problem. It's all over the place. Um, you know, I you know I just uh, I could have certainly shopped around for a, a larger publisher than uh, Nine Banded Books, but I'm quite happy with the limited release this uh, work is getting with Nine Banded Books because. Uh, not only is it the, you know, the only deal in town. It's, it's. Uh, I think uh, Nine Banded Bolt Books is going to be a cool publisher down the road, the road a ways, and it's going to be, uh, it's going to be something cool. And uh, if you're going to do something, you might as well make it cool. Uh, is there anything else you would like to uh, add about the book that we didn't touch on? Uh. You know, Chip asked me some questions about the book, and uh, I'd written these stories in 2005, 2006. I just finished a full-length novel. As I said, uh, I wanted to write some short stories because uh, I realized, having written this giant novel, that uh, it's not giant, but it's uh, a good size, that uh, people don't have the uh, attention spans really to handle these big novels anymore, or it needs what. I need to write now some short stories. <clears throat> so I wrote maybe a dozen short stories, and uh, I sent some of them to Chip, and uh, got these published. And I, I don't know, uh, the stories uh, are, the way I put it is, they are what they are. Um, it may not be, you know, it's uh, it's not possible to accept them at face value, because that's not... Uh, it's just impossible to do. They are, uh, without blowing my own horn, I'm not saying I'm the greatest writer in the world. That's not what I'm saying here, but I wrote these stories in an, a specific manner to appeal to the reader and to get a point across. It's not a political point, but it does have a point for the reader to discern. And uh, that's pretty much all I can say for the stories. So uh, you have a uh, well, you have a radio podcast which is relatively new on a talk show, but it's called American uh, Onslaught. Can you tell us about that and uh, what is? I've, I've been doing the American Onslaught to broadcast so off and on for years, but uh, Daryl uh, over at uh, on uh, Facebook has pretty much been after me to do broadcasts on a, a regular basis. And if he's going to wrangle me guests, well, I'll interview guests. Um, I like doing interviews. I think I did one of the first interviews with uh, Matt Parrott some time ago, uh, maybe four or five years ago, too, and uh, several other uh, individuals before they uh, became uh, well-known on the alternative right. But uh, I'm, uh, I'm an in- I am uh, enjoy doing interviews. Uh, American Onslaught is... Uh, Probably going to be expanded later on. Uh, I've uh, I'm very interested in radio. The problem with internet radio is that, of course, outreach is a big issue, and I'm not really self 
motor. But uh, we'll be growing, and if you do it steadily, you get an audience. Uh, I've been involved in trying to uh, actually purchase a radio station in the past and uh, in the uh, Ozark area and uh, manage it, but uh, the prob- there's a, a huge number of problems uh, related to that, and uh, one of the initial problems uh, uh, we had was uh, our backers didn't necessarily like the lineup of hosts that uh, we were going to uh, potentially have on and this radio show picking up. Sorry, go ahead. Can you say uh, who some of those hosts are? Uh, we were we were hoping to uh, carry or broadcast the political self Pool and uh, a few other shows like that. Uh, James Edwards outfit out of uh, Memphis, Tennessee, I believe it is. And uh, uh, I had a you know kind of a list there, but. Uh, of course, the backers m- must have Googled them. I don't think they'd ever heard of James Edwards or some of these other guys before on Internet radio or satellite radio, but uh, that kind of, that deal kind of fell through. And the other part of the deal was that uh, the guy I was going in on, with on it didn't really understand uh, my interest in culture. He wanted the station to be wholly in, uh, dealing with uh, the political uh, talk radio. Uh, daytime t- news talk radio, whereas I wanted to have a more uh, cultural talk radio type deal and uh, play play more music, do things like that, uh, interview musicians, have a more a mix between news talk and NPR is the way I would put it, uh, something like that, but with a uh, conservative rightist bent and. And uh, basically, I would say that uh, our uh, we all had the same goal and that we wanted to get the radio station, but what we wanted to do with it was drastically different. So, 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 so that's the reason uh, that things didn't work out, I'd say. Is uh, American Onslaught, is it affiliated with the gangster Bolshevik movement? Well, they're gangster Bolsheviks on it. It's not really affiliated. They have their own uh, gangster Bolshevik uh, broadcast um, broadcasting uh, show. Uh, I'm uh, I'm interested in a lot of political movements that I'm not necessarily a part of or eligible to belong to, but uh, uh, I just have an interest in politics. What do you What do you mean by uh, in general? What do you mean by uh, eligible? Well, I don't feel qualified to belong to, uh, well, I'm obviously not, I'm obviously uh, half white, so uh, I'm, I wouldn't, uh, of course, be eligible to be a uh, white nationalist or something like that. So what is, what but is your, I am uh, interested in white nationalism. I am what interested is, in... Uh, what is your other uh, half of your background? I'm white and uh, an American Indian. But uh, you're willing to interview those kind of people. Yeah, I'm very interested in... Uh, it's not just white nationalism. I'm also interested in uh, the resurgence of uh, the uh, American Indian movement. I'm interested in uh, uh, black nationalists that are interested in returning to Africa and starting a movement there. A few years ago, I, was, I joked around that I tried to get uh, uh, American... Uh, American whites to go back to Europe and the American uh, blacks to go back to Africa and leave the continent to uh, the uh, mixed bloods and will run things uh, on uh, what you might call the half half bloods or what have you. The, uh, you know what? You know what? Uh, things because the full bloods what, aren't quite up to it. Sorry, go ahead. You know, I interviewed uh, this. I interviewed this guy on my radio show. Uh, he goes by the name Bay Area Guy, and he was kind of uh, he was kind of joking, but he was saying his uh, friends who are mixed race are actually some of the most politically incorrect people he knows. Well, the interesting thing about um, being mixed race is that, uh, especially if you're about fifty-fifty like I am, uh, is that you 
understand certain things about genetics, and uh, you understand uh, certain things about genetic impact on you. You can feel uh, a bit bipolar sometimes, and I've actually studied quite a lot about uh, about uh, interracial uh, uh, the science of interracial uh, beings. I think a lot of uh, miscegenation leads to uh, mental illness in the individual honestly. I'm not saying I'm mentally ill or I've experienced that problem, but I do believe from my studies that it's led to mental illness uh, and, and also I think it kind of creates a split personality in some ways. And this is very politically incorrect to say, you know, um, even whites would have a problem with it because I think it's more than just a white or black or white or an Indian or white or an Asian individual. It can also be various white ethnicities that uh, cause certain forms of uh, mental Im Ill imbalances when they are intermarried. Because in the past, you talk about the great white races. Uh, there are white races, in my view, and, and everybody knows this. You have the Nords and the... Uh, uh, the Meds and so on, different forms, the Slavs, the Teutons, uh, uh, and the Anglo-Saxons. You know, I can't list them all off the top of my head. But the point is, is that certain intermixtures, if you take a Slav and an Irishman, you, you're going, you're, we don't necessarily... Yeah, I mean, I'm personally, I'm personally a mixture of a lot of those different groups you mentioned, like, uh, like Scandinavian, Polish, uh, Irish, German... But I think that's the well, norm, that's again, the norm for uh, most a large portion of Americans. Most Americans are, and what we have a we have an issue in North America right now where North Americans have the highest rate of mental illness. They have the right, highest rate of obesity, depression, and other illnesses. And I believe this is partially because North America has become a melting pot, not only for the third world races, but also for the first world races. For uh, for whites, um, there was a white melting pot before there was the, before the third world poured into the United States, and uh, I think that's had a effect on Americans who you know will proudly proclaim themselves mongrels, and uh, well, I'll pro um, in some ways uh, hybridization may be considered good, but uh, you know the good old American white mongrel. And that's not necessarily the ideal situation, in my opinion, as a mon speaking as a mongrel myself, that I believe a lot of, uh, I believe, I've come around almost to belief in the purity of the blood, because uh, uh, the more heterogeneous a people become, the less they can connect to any particular identity. And the more they have those different types of blood sometimes conflicting, in their minds, warring with each other potentially in some aspects of their lives, and causing them dif difficulty. So, I'm. This is just a hypothesis by me. But um, again, as, as a mixed blood myself, I am. I am. Uh, who is? I have done some uh, research in the, in this, and I'm just speculating that this may well be a cause of some of the difficulty, and it's also some of the reasons whites can't unite uh, in the United States um, because they don't have any core identities to unite behind. I mean, even um, cul I mean, even culture, I mean, um, the uh, culture has been watered down so much, a lot of uh, white Americans don't have, a, don't really have well, much of a culture. There's other. no common culture. Yeah, it's basically just there's all this. There's been a common culture. Oh, it's just all this consumerism and all this uh, pop culture garbage. Um, at one time, you know, we're we're all supposed to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Well, I I've had my uh, DNA uh, tested, and I don't have any Irish in me at all. So there's no way, you know, why should I celebrate St. Patrick's Day even if I were white? I well, it's, no, it's just uh, it's an, it's Irish just, holiday. It's more about uh, it's like Cinco de Mayo. It's more about an excuse to go out and get get hammered. That's correct. But again, we uh, there is no core American white identity or white culture in the United States. You have a, frag a diversity of white cultures. You have uh, German, Irish, uh, uh, 
some Swedish, uh, different uh, Italians, uh, but you don't have a one overall overarching white American culture or identity. And that's why I think people are at a loss to coalesce, for something to coalesce around. And uh, that's one of the biggest problems, in my opinion. And uh, I have had considerable experience um, uh, observing uh, various uh, white groups, both uh, in person and on the Internet, and talk to a great number of people. And uh, that seems to be the pr principal problem. If you can't unite around something common, then, you know, you're out of luck. You know, you can't. You can't get people to follow just uh, I ideology, certainly. And you mentioned uh, er, you mentioned to me earlier that you were doing research on different communities in the Ozarks. Yes, uh, communitarianism. I don't like the word communitarianism. Communitarianism first came to my attention because uh, my mentor was a gentleman named William Roberts, uh, who passed away uh, in January of this year. He had the vocal local. I get vocal local uh, radio show on Oracle Broadcasting before it folded in uh, 2012. And uh, he was quite an astute uh, political thinker, and uh, unfortunately he never put out a book or anything, but he was quite well known in, uh, in uh, property rights circles, circles having to do with uh, uh, land ownership and... Uh, uh, tax freedom movements from the 90s. Uh, he was briefly affiliated with uh, David Duke, so, um, but uh, he hasn't had any affiliation with any groups or since then. But uh, Will made the point that, um, one of his points, that uh, this communitarianism that is being spread by numerous liberal and internationalist organizations is artificial. It's not a genuine communitarianism because they're essentially creating plastic communities. And they're, uh, the whole purpose of what they call Agenda 21 that Glenn Beck finally heard about and used to, he uses on his show to scare the old, old uh, geezers who listen to him, <laughs> the whole point of Agenda 21 is to create these new model communities uh, that are essentially uh, synthetic, and of people who are uh, plasticized and uh, put into these communities. So what I was interested in doing was studying communities, the remnant of communities that exist. Now, in southwest Missouri, we have a few communities, the last that are organic. We have Mennonites who are slowly, uh, slowly uh, becoming uh, more, uh, losing their unique old world flavor. We have the Amish who are being uh, technologically inundated uh, and watered down. Their their own uh, lifestyle is being watered down by technology, though they still retain a lot of their old ways. And uh, it seems to me actually that the Amish and both the Amish and Mennonite uh, women are more resilient than the men to the uh, cultural changes. But um, then you also have some organic communities of individuals who have lived in southwest Missouri for over 100 years. We have a lot of century farms, some of them in, our, in operation and some of them are not in operation, but they exist to this day and the family has lived on that land for over 100 years. And uh, there's a barn on a property that I work on that is uh, over 100 and 20 years old, it's standing up pretty pretty darn good, made out of uh, white oak logs, and uh, it was one of those barns they created at the turn of the uh, 20th, 19th to the 20th century, and those the people who built it, their ancestors still live in that same valley and still uh, run cattle, uh, and uh, there's still something of the clannish mentality uh, remaining in the uh, in the uh, Ozark region, and uh, so it's interesting to study and see what traditions remain and what uh, what uh, the rem remnant of all that uh, is 
the impact of that of those traditions have on people. Now, I like to say that the U.S. government is waging biological war upon the uh, old stock American uh, people because if you think about it, you, people like to talk used to like to talk about the pioneer origins of of uh, the United States, and uh, I would interview a lot of elderly people in their 80s and 90s when I was in my teens and uh, talk about talk about uh, how uh, we they'd uh, you know their ancestors had come to this area in covered wagons and uh, you know gotten settled settled on the land and uh, built their houses and built their barns and far and farmed uh, farmed the land and uh, since then, a lot of their those people, their descendants have have either left the land, been driven off of it by the diff, or uh, basically remained on the land. And those individuals, you can see, they're under attack at this moment. Partially, it's because of uh, banking practices, and partially it's because of. Uh, uh, health issues because one thing you'll see is very prevalent in Missouri as in much of the rural south is that uh, obesity is a huge problem and you'll notice it affects certain types of people more than others. It affects a lot of the old stock uh, 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 Celtic uh, stock, uh, Scotch-Irish stock particularly and I'm interested in studying types of people, studying family names and things like that seeing what uh, what ha what uh, diseases they're prone to I'm interested in seeing since the Great Recession what we've seen in a lot of little communities is that uh, uh, the folks will uh, you know uh, basically everybody will come back to uh, grandma and granddad's uh, homestead because uh, they can't afford to live in town or they can't afford to pay the rent so they'll come and get a uh, mobile home and put it on uh, granddad's back 40 and live there and they might help him with the uh, livestock so you'll so you'll have a uh, folks who own maybe 120 acres and there'll be uh, a whole uh, a whole family the whole family will come home and live on that land and they'll commute to work every day and you see that quite often in the remaining communities that are able to uh, survive the current onslaught because uh, but they they have the advantage of uh, having factories to work in, like the chicken processing plant. Now, in eastern Missouri, they are more or less out of luck because the only uh, remaining uh, industry is logging in eastern Missouri and a lot of counties over uh, in the southeast. And consequently, the result is that uh, uh, a lot of those counties are being depopulated in mass. You have Texas County, one of the largest counties in Missouri, it's over 1,200 square miles, uh, has a population of less than uh, 20,000. And uh, so it's quite interesting to see the individuals in these communities begin to lose their identity slowly. Part of it is the influx of uh, country radio, uh, the TV impact on them. Uh, the deleterious influence of Walmart, and partially it's uh, it's you know it's due down to the food they eat. Everything is uh, determined to destroy their identity. But once a person's individual identity or family identity or racial identity is destroyed, it's more than that. They have lost their political identity beforehand, and people lose their political identity in Southwest Missouri because they don't have property. They don't have a connection to the town they grew up in necessarily. People will go to a high school reunion, but they won't vote because they feel a certain kinship or uh, nostalgia for that high school, those high school towns, but they don't have much of a nostalgia for the small town or community they grew up in, and consequently they may live in there all their lives and never vote. That's what we see with the uh, 18 to 45-year-old demographic, um, which is uh, 
the Generation X and Generation Y, which I call Generation Faggot and Generation Maggot, Duh. is uh, often unwilling to uh, become politically involved because they don't have that sense of identity or investment in the community. And the other issue uh, you're involved, you're also involved with, uh, you're a proponent of public banking and uh, infrastructure and utilities reform. Well, it all goes back to the original part of having a uh, autonomous region. You have to uh, have your own money. You have to keep it in your own banks. Uh, I think the reputation of the uh, Bank of uh, North Dakota is quite well known and how, how well it works. Uh, that can be du duplicated on a county level. And I'm in the process of introducing that idea. I just gave a talk on it last night uh, to throughout my county in Missouri and uh, kind of uh, let, making people aware of it and discussing this with our candidates and using my organization to uh, promote this uh, public banking option. Basically, uh, people don't realize where do the tax dollars go. When they bank tax dollars, what banks do they put them in? They put them in the same banks uh, that went, that uh, basically take people's money and uh, just ship it right up to uh, Wall Street for use in, uh, in, in uh, private investment. And public funds, of course, should not be used for private investment. And... Uh, the other issue there is that, of course, people are trying, uh, public officials are constantly trying to wring every dollar in tax money out of the population, and they have no choice but to do this because the way the situation is now, uh, you have a situation where uh, they are desperate for money. The, it's either federal money or it's local tax dollars. And federal money, most grants and aid uh, require uh, matching uh, matching pledges from the local government you have to give so much money and they'll match you know they'll match you with a grant but you have to put up so much money or float a bond or what have you and consequently what happens is that uh, they are at a loss for ways to come up with enough money to maintain enough public funds to main to maintain the basic public works projects of uh, roads bridges uh, public buildings and so on. And uh, right now, of course, in sc our schools, our system in Missouri is not connected to the uh, local tax base. Uh, they get their money from the state, or they're under the state. Uh, they're under state tax jurisdiction. But uh, the uh, county commission, public works department, is uh, is all funded by sales tax in uh, in my county. So. I feel that public banking is the ideal option to ascertain that those dollars uh, stay within the county, within the state, and those public uh, funds stay within the county and stay within the state, and they, they can also be used as tax credits, uh, not tax credits, I'm sorry, as uh, uh, money available to uh, banks to generate interest, uh, uh, to generate loan uh, material and credit, uh, interest-free credit as well. So that's um, interest-free credit is the other pos positive aspect of these banks and why they're really needed at this time because all the money, as you're well aware, and I think most of your listeners would be well aware, uh, all the money that uh, Bernanke has printed has gone into the big banks, and it's not really uh, trickled down into the smaller, uh, small-town banks and rural banks of the Midwest and the South. Yeah, I, I get you know what you're saying because uh, the Ron uh, Ron Paul uh, is he is correct that the Federal Reserve is uh, fraudulent, but he doesn't really have any. But he doesn't have any solutions to the problem. I mean, he's sort of he's saying he has he's saying some of the right things about what's wrong, but he doesn't have any 
solutions, and I think you're right that uh, public banking is a solution to this. Yes, uh, I used to be an Austrian economist, or into, uh, uh, but uh, I gave up on it because uh, basically uh, I didn't see the Austrians had any solution to any situation. And this was prior to uh, the Ron Paul uh, 2007 campaign. I just didn't see any. Uh, there was not a single Austrian uh, economics writer out there who was capable of doing anything about the economic situation. So. I felt uh, it was necessary to turn to other means. Now, Ellen Brown, I don't always agree with either, but she is, of course, the definitive uh, author of the definitive work on public banking in this day and age. But uh, let's not forget that ben Benjamin Franklin, in volume two of his memoirs, also has a good word to say for public banking. And uh, you've been involved with some uh, main, uh, mainstream politics. I know, have you, did you work with uh, Representative Mike Moon? I had worked with Mike Moon when he ran for Congress uh, the first time, uh, and then he ran for uh, state representative now, and I've been, uh, 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 he's a really good guy, I must say. Mike is a, uh, Mike is an original. I think he will run for higher office. And, uh, uh, he's really motivated by Christian principles. Uh, I had worked on several campaigns. I'm not going to name all of them. I've been a precinct committee man and uh, worked within the Republican Party, and I worked on both Ron Paul campaigns. Right now I'm in the process, as of just this very day, of uh, trying to gain control of the Republican uh, uh, Party committee of uh, my county. And... Uh, uh, I'll kind of I'll know uh, what the score is tomorrow on uh, how we're going to do on in the uh, gaining control of the uh, Republican County Committee. Uh, well, I've uh, campaigned on that for last month, and uh, so I'm kind of uh, interested to see how that's going to turn out. And uh, your upcoming project, uh, you you have a uh, you're working on a rock opera. I'm working on a rock opera, and a lot of people think I'm trolling because I'm a. <laughs> Are I'm you going to say what it's of? Troll, but uh, uh, it's a rock opera based on Mein Kampf, and uh, I went around advertising on Craigslist for uh, for about six months, and uh, trying to find somebody who would be willing to work with me on this project, a, a composer. And I have, I can't mention his name because uh, not everybody wants to be in the forefront. Uh, this ge um, but uh, this gentleman recognized it as an artistic project and was willing to go with, in with me on this. Now, uh, I don't really uh, have a problem with Hitler. And I'm again, I'm not trying to troll. This is not springtime for Hitler type deal, if anything. So it's, it's, not, it's, a, not, it's not going to be like the producers with, uh, what's it called, Nathan, well, the original, there was the original one with Bell Brooks, but there was a remake with uh, Nathan Lane and Matthew, Matthew Broderick. It's not going to be like that. Yeah, no, no, it's, if anything, it's a little bit serious, and just, it's kind of, uh, I, I don't really go into the politics a whole lot. What my interest in is in, uh, uh, Will Roberts would always tell me about Hitler was that he knew who he was and who he and whose he was, and I think that's something that most people on the right can't say today. That, uh, most people don't know who they are and whose they are, and uh, I'm not here to t tell you, you know, who or whom that you know one is supposed to belong to or who one should be. But I know one has to know that in their own heart before they can go ahead with any grand project or any project at all of political magnitude. Because you can't convince people of your views unless you know who you are and whose you are. Well, it is probably it's probably gonna you're probably gonna have a hard time uh, getting uh, the actors and the, the singers. It's going to be a bitch, honestly. But uh, I'm looking forward to it because. That's been one of the problems I've had writing plays in the past. I've written lines in novels and plays and stuff, and suddenly I woke up one day and I realized who is who would possibly 
I know some actors, and this goes back to Population I again, because I'm describing those people, the people in the theater today. It's a very, it's a very um, gay, and I don't mean to necessarily uh, be uh, homophobic here. That's not my intent. A lot of times, uh, it's like a Hammerlock song lyric. It's, a, it's called "Snide Little Faggot." Snide Little Faggot ain't necessarily gay. It's just a condescending punk with nothing good to say. And I can't imagine my lines being said by the type of snide little faggots who write or who act in a lot of theater productions these days, female and male. And so that's a problem. That's a, a huge problem, but we're going to surmount that problem, even if I have to uh, uh, use puppets like that uh, German director in one of uh, that uh, jo Jonathan Bowden talks about in one of his lectures. We'll... Uh, We'll plan to uh, stage this play, but part of the play is, of course, the music. And I can actually send out CDs of, cer of some of the songs we've written because uh, the music, you know, the songs are focused on uh, the aspect of Hitler as the dreamer, Hitler thinking of the future, um, uh. Hitler imagining what the future could be, Hitler being led. Um, you know, into the future. And, uh, you know, Hitler said he dreamed a lot. And uh, it was one of the uh, motivations for accomplishment. And so Dreamwalker, for example, is one of the, song of one of the songs. And uh, it's based on dreams and the idea of how dreams and ambitions and so on affect individuals. So, uh, Paul, uh, I'd like to thank you. Uh, that was Paul Bingham. I'd like to thank you uh, for being on the show.